Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you on the second of the, uh, our sessions focus on Kashak Museum in Budapest, which is our special guest of 2021, Trania Sefo, uh, which was prepared and uh, talking about some sort of a universe, uh, establishing the universe as a uh, place built on different uh, moments, uh, interests, interactions, uh, ideas. Uh, Merce Palsheri, who uh, currently leads Kashag Museum in Budapest, is going to uh, talk about uh, their permanent exhibition, which is going to be uh, moved and removed this year. Uh, and hopefully he's going to show us a virtual guide tour there. I would like to uh, introduce him at least very briefly, and then uh, I would, uh, would give him a floor. In a case of any questions, which are very, very welcome, uh, just write them uh, in your chats, uh, and I will read them uh, after the session. So, Mercier Pal Sheridi holds MA in Art History from Etwesh Laurent University, where he is currently studying for a PhD. He is currently the head of the department at the Kashag Museum, where he works since 2015. He is a member of the research group Alayosh Kashak's Avant Garde Journals from Interdisciplinary Perspective, 1915 1928, since 2016. His research focuses on Hungarian avant garde art and the history of Lajos Kashak's magazine Ma today in Vienna between 20, 1920 and 1925, with special emphasis on its international networks. He has curated exhibition in the Kashak Museum, in the Virak Judith Gallery in Budapest, and the Janusz Panonius Museum in Pech. He has also worked an exhibition in the Hungarian National Gallery and the Berlinische Gallery. He works has been published in several academic journals, exhibition catalogs, and multi-offer volumes. I think we are all very much interested in, not just in Hungarian avant-garde, but avant-garde as such, also because the main uh, aim of this kind of um, artists or a group or a base uh, was to uh, re-establish the world, make some sort of a changes uh, in social as well as aesthetic level. So I would like to give um, uh, space to Merche to introduce us, uh, not just to this kind of a universe, but also to the exhibition which presents it. Merche, uh, it's yours. Thank you very much and good evening to everyone. Uh, once again, I'm uh, very grateful for this invitation and I, will, I would like to thank the, the organizers in the name of the whole staff of the Kashak Museum. Now I'm going to share my screen where I'm going to walk you through the permanent exhibition of the Kashak Museum in a virtual form. This is a new uh, development that we have just finished. It's still a beta version. We have some changes, some modifications ahead, but hopefully during the course of the coming months, we will be able to publish it online. And so you can explore the permanent collection of the museum virtually uh, through our website. The, the Kashak Museum, as we have been talking about it during the last session a few weeks ago with Edith Shoshvari, the former director of the museum, is a very small museum located in the Obuda district of Budapest. It has been open since the 70s and its original purpose was to serve as a memorial space for Lajos Kashak. The permanent collection of the museum uh, holds the archives and the uh, literary and artistic oeuvre of Lajos Kaszak. Most of our pieces are coming from directly the uh, estate of Kaszak, which has been acquired by the Hungarian Literary Museum after the death of uh, this uh, important figure of the Hungarian avant-garde uh, in the late 60s. And uh, of course, this, this form of a memorial museum uh, has changed a lot since the 70s when it was first opened. And we are trying to adopt new methods, new points of view, new uh, sensibilities towards the material that we host in the museum. And we're trying to figure out new ways of presenting our materials, 
with the help of uh, of new research uh, incorporating new research new methodology new standpoints into our uh, uh, permanent exhibition this current uh, show which uh, uh, um, serves as a permanent collection of the museum has been open since uh, 2011 and it has been curated by Edith Shashvari and Judith Chatlos. They were the first uh, uh, of the current staff of the museum, which had a complete renewal in 2010. Uh, they decided to approach Koshak's work not through and not solely through the um, life and work of the artist and poet and writer Koshak, but to focus on his uh, work as an organizer, as an editor, as a person who was, <clears throat> in fact, a driving force behind Hungarian avant-garde from the 1910s up until his death. So the focus of this exhibition is not on and not exclusively on Koshak, but on the context in which Koshak worked and the context that which uh, he has created for the Hungarian avant-garde during the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s. Uh, the focus of the exhibition is on magazines, literary and artistic journals that Koshak has published there are many of these journals throughout his career, and it's uh, incredibly fruitful and interesting to take a look at these journals, either separately in depth or uh, uh, to, to try to establish the connections between these journals and try to reconstruct the process uh, through which these journals were actually created not as a, a sole artistic process uh, by Koshak, but as a, a cooperative uh, effort with the help of several different uh, visual artists, uh, poets uh, and, uh, and writers and intellectuals. And uh, in this uh, presentation today, I would like to walk you through these uh, journals, these, uh, these sections of our exhibition very briefly. And uh, of course, I would like to encourage you to try and, and uh, uh, go into more depth with the, with the content of these journals, because most of the journals that Koshak has published, published were not only uh, in Hungarian, but most of these journals had uh, actually international content as well, including German, uh, French, Italian, even English uh, um, publications inside. And of course, the design and, uh, and the visual part of these journals were also very important. But first of all, I would like to talk briefly about Koshak himself. And to do this, I have this photo of him from 1916. This was the, uh, the actually it was taken during the time of his literary debut and during the time when he first started to publish avant-garde journals. Uh, you can see that he has a very particular look and he was very particular about his look actually. Uh, it was taken during the First World War. Uh, of course, uh, Hungary as a part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy was very much involved in the First World War. And during this time, most of the uh, intellectuals, the artists of Hungarian modernism were pro-war. Uh, however, Koshak was firmly anti-war from the first moment on. And uh, he was never drafted, he actually, uh, uh, tried to avoid getting drafted for the First World War several times. 
and of course his long hair which is an uh, a typical form of wearing his uh, his hair during this period was also a statement and uh, as you can see he's not wearing a white shirt he's wearing a black silk shirt this was also a very important statement with his look it was the typical attire of russian anarchists during this time and he adapted actually he adapted this this look in 1909 when he traveled to western europe uh, by foot he he actually had this uh, this very interesting voyage throughout uh, austria germany belgium and then finally he arrived to paris and throughout this journey he met many of the uh, back then exiled russian anarchists and he was very interested in this whole movement and this whole ideology and when he started to appear in hungary as an artist as a poet he started to to create his own uh, self-image as this very uh, eccentric bohemian uh, figure who was very different from anyone else during this period in hungarian modernism but to trace the origins of Koshak's art, we have to go even uh, uh, more back in time to his childhood and early years. He was born in Ershekuivar, which is now in Slovakia. He was coming from a, uh, uh, a working class family. And he himself, actually, he, uh, uh, he did not finish high school, but he started to work as a Luxmith's apprentice. And later on, during his teens, he came to Budapest to work in factories. It was here that he uh, got introduced into the workers' movement and he started to uh, hear lectures about socialism and read socialist democratic literature. And he was very much involved in uh, the organizational work of the socialist movement during the early 1900s. And once he started to organize a strike and he got fired from his job and he was not able to work in any factories anymore because of his socialist uh, points of view. And this is when he uh, had the idea to start writing uh, literature, poems, and uh, he wanted to make his way into this socialist democratic workers movement through um, cultural work through writing poems and to become a poet he thought that uh, he must visit paris which was the capital of art and and culture at the turn of the century but as he was not working and he was coming from a poor family with no education, he had no other chance but to actually walk there. And this story is uh, actually very well documented through his correspondence with his later wife, Yolan Shimon, as well as uh, in several of his poems and uh, his autobiography, which he published in the late 1920s. We're actually working on a Hungarian and English version of uh, the reconstruction of this trip to Western Europe, this Vagabondage, which is going to be published during the coming month uh, on our website in, a, in an electronic version. So I'm really recommending you to look for it. And during the later presentations of this series, we will surely uh, share the link to this book with you so you that can you so that you can you can take a look at this amazing story of Koshak walking to Paris uh, through the course of like eight months in 1909. When he returned to Hungary, he was already very much committed to working as a poet. He started to publish his own poems in several different uh, journals, literary journals, and, uh, and uh, 
socialist democratic journals as well. And by the mid 1910s, uh, he was uh, very much involved in Hungarian literary life. And uh, of course, his first poems were very much uh, tied to the late modernist turn of the century style, which was very dominant in Hungary by that time. But during the 1910s, he started to adopt a new method, a new approach, which uh, he actually thought that it suited the, uh, the purpose of his, of his work, his, uh, his content much more. And this style was a mixture of futurism and expressionism. He was actually one of the first poets to adopt this new avant-garde style, but right after his first publications, many others came along. And this is why he decided to start an own journal. And he started the magazine called Atet, which means the action in 1915. This was in a very particular uh, political and artistic context in uh, the mid 1910s. It was the first world war going on. And as I have already said, Kosciak was very firmly against the war. He was a pacifist. And of course he started to criticize both the uh, pro-war intellectuals and the pro-war socialist movement, which was uh, also trying to encourage the working class in Hungary, especially in Budapest, to participate in the First World War during this first period of the First World War in 1914 and 1915. And uh, this magazine called The Action, edited by Kosciak, was actually the first and only pacifist journal published in Hungary during the period of the First World War. And it was, of course, very much attacked by the pro-war press and pro-war intellectuals on the basis of this anti-militaristic attitude that they adopted. And on the other hand, this journal was very much filled with uh, uh, new avant-garde poems and artworks and uh, actually it was a very uh, small but ever-growing um, movement behind Kosciak, which consisted of young workers, young intellectuals, who started to write in this new expressionistic, futuristic style, and also started to paint pictures and uh, draw drawings, uh, adopting this new style. But the, uh, the main uh, uh, cohesive force behind Kosciak's movement was never the style. It was always the content. It was always the intended meaning, which was always focused on uh, the working class. It was always focused on uh, social problems, social issues. It was always focused on the critique of the of the uh, hegemonic uh, or mainstream uh, discourse about uh, politics and about artistic life. So they were an avant-garde movement in, in two different senses. They were avant-garde in their style and they were avant-garde in their uh, content or in their intended meaning. Unfortunately, this magazine, uh, The Action, was very short-lived. It was actually banned by the authorities uh, just uh, within one year of its first publication. Only 16 issues were uh, published and then uh, it was banned uh, in Hungary by the authorities on the basis that its content uh, uh, endangered or interfered with the with the uh, uh, the war efforts of the government, but Kosciak did not give up, and he continued to publish his journals. And this is when we are going to move into the second room of our exhibition, which is devoted to the magazine Ma. 
this was published right after <clears throat> sorry the, the the magazine ma was published right after the first journal Otet was banned so the first issue was uh, was published in november 1916 just one month before after the the action was banned by the government and uh, this journal became the longest running Hungarian avant-garde magazine with 10 volumes published between 1916 and 1925. And actually it is amongst the longest running avant-garde journals in the world, actually. Uh, Ma, the title of the magazine means today. And uh, it's very important to see that the subtitle of the magazine was changed as well, and it's an important change, which was intended for the protection of this whole movement and tells us much about the, the actual committedness or commitment of Koshak towards preserving this whole movement as, and uh, providing a forum, providing a platform for these young artists that were gathered around him. The subtitle for the action was uh, a journal for literature, the arts and politics. While the subtitle of Ma, which uh, was published already during the First World War, was changed to just a, a journal for literature and the arts. So you can see that they omitted politics on the surface. They were still very much committed to social issues. They were very much committed to uh, political agendas. They were still very much committed to um, anti-war propaganda or pacifism, but they changed the whole outlook of the magazine and they changed the whole system of presenting their ideas to make it more subtle so that they could survive and they don't have to close down this journal as well. <clears throat> By this time, Koshak was already in contact with international avant-garde artists. As you can see uh, on the cover of the first issue of Ma, uh, a lino cut by Vincent Benesch, uh, Czech uh, cubist artist was uh, printed and also the whole outline, the whole outlook of the magazine was uh, very much similar or inspired by the Berlin-based expressionist magazine Der Sturm, The Storm. This magazine was also anti-war, it published anti-war uh, literature and published anti-war art in Germany during the uh, First World War. And Koshak was very much inspired by the whole style and the whole approach of its editor, uh, Herbert Walden. Ma uh, was very much embedded into the Hungarian system of uh, literature and the arts. And it's very important to see that Koshak was very much committed to include fine artists, visual artists as well into the whole movement. He actually opened up a gallery, which was uh, one room in his apartment in the outskirts of Budapest. But still he was able to create a space where uh, new artists, young avant-garde artists, were able to present their artworks. And therefore, this small gallery, which was run by Koshak, became actually one of the most interesting and most visited hotspots of Hungarian uh, artistic life during the First World War. Here you can see a photo of a presentation of the artworks of uh, Janos Matis Deutsch who was an expressionist painter coming from Transylvania. He was inspired by the artworks of uh, the Blue Rider group in Munich, Der Blaue Reiter, 
Kandinsky, Franz Marc, and so on. And he actually painted these landscapes, which were very abstract and very colorful. And they made a very important and very strong impact on Hungarian artistic life when they were first exhibited in Budapest in uh, 1917. I would like to show you also a group photo of Kosciak and his movement. This is not a picture of all the participants of his, uh, of his group, but still you can see the most important actors in his movement. You can see Kosciak in the middle of the, of the photo. On uh, his left side, uh, uh, you can see Jolan Shimon, who was his partner and later wife. She was uh, also a worker, a factory worker. They got acquainted in the socialist movement at the turn of the century. And uh, actually she also left uh, working at a factory because she was also very much committed to Kosciak's cause. And she became uh, an actress. She was involved in uh, reciting these poems that Kosciak and his fellow artists wrote during this time. And she was also very much involved in the financial organization of this whole movement. So he was a person behind the scenes. She was not a writer, she was not a visual artist, but she was one of the most important organizers of this movement who was always uh, very much committed to, to what Kosciak was talking about and what Kosciak was uh, trying to achieve. And actually she was also in a way a co-editor of these magazines. And it is also recorded in the autobiography of Kosciak that uh, she was also very much active in uh, selecting the materials and compiling the issues of the journals. On the right side of Kosciak, you can see another uh, young woman. She was Erzsi Uivari, and she was the younger sister of Kosciak, who also became an avant-garde poet and uh, who married Sandor Barta on the far right side of this image. Uh, and Barta was also a poet. He was uh, first a very adamant critic of Kosciak and later became a very prominent member of this whole group. And he became actually a co-editor of Ma. But you can see that they were actually tied together by family as well. And this is also true for Bela Uitz, who's standing on the right side of Ergi Uivari. He was a painter. And he was the husband of the other sister of Kosciak. So he was also a brother-in-law for Kosciak. And he was actually the artistic co-editor of Ma. And uh, he was also very much involved in organizing the movement and gathering visual artists for Kosciak during this period. And on the far left side of the image, this large, uh, tall man is Sandor Bortnik, who was another painter coming from Transylvania. And he was actually one of the most influential artists of this whole group. Uh, you can see a few of his expressionist lino cuts on the cover of the magazine Ma from 1918, 1919. These artworks were actually very much uh, uh, praised by uh, Hungarian artists and uh, critiques during this period, which was the time of the end of the First World War and the time of the uh, revolutions in Hungary. As uh, after the fall of uh, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, there was a democratic, revolution in 1918 and by March 1919 there was another revolution in Hungary which was a communist revolution 
and uh, uh, the communists took over power from the democratic government and they formed the Hungarian Soviet uh, Republic, which lasted for around four months from spring to late summer 1919, but which had a very important and very radical impact on the course of uh, Koshak and his whole movement. Because they were actually very committed to this cause, of course, they were uh, socialist, they were uh, progressive thinkers, and they thought that these radical changes in society and politics could very well collide with their ideas. And so they were very active during the time of this uh, socialist uh, uh, republic, the Soviet Republic. And when it collapsed and the right-wing government emerged, then they were all pro uh, persecuted and they had to flee persecution <clears throat> into Vienna. Uh, this was a time when uh, actually most of, the, most of the Hungarian leftist intellectuals were forced into exile. They were forced to leave the country. It lasted for about five years for most of these uh, artists and writers and intellectuals, but they were not allowed to enter into Hungary because otherwise they would have uh, been uh, persecuted and put into prison. <clears throat> so they actually had to flee. They had to live in exile, but Koshak was never actually committed to settle in Vienna. It was always a temporary, settlement it was a temporary space for him and so he continued to publish his magazine ma in exile it was not allowed in hungary it was not uh, they were not able to send the printed issues to hungary but still he was talking to hungarians he was printing the magazine in hungarian he was focusing mostly in the first issues, the first volumes that were published in Vienna, he was focusing on Hungarian politics, on Hungarian issues, and uh, he was actually uh, distributing his magazine within the Hungarian-speaking communities in Austria, in Czechoslovakia, in Romania, in uh, Yugoslavia. So all the countries that uh, became independent after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. But at the same time, uh, Ma and the whole movement changed a lot after the Soviet Republic. Koshak became aware that uh, direct political agendas and political agitation was not possible uh, at that time that it, it led to a collusion with politics, uh, that their ideas, their style, their politics was so much different from those of the mainstream socialists and communists. And so he departed from direct agitation. He departed from an activist uh, uh, program. And he started to focus more on a utopistic idea of changing the whole character of the working class, of educating them, of transmitting knowledge and transmitting new ideas. And uh, he was talking about a way to, to revolutionize the culture of the people and not revolutionize, uh, revolutionize the, the politics and uh, the, uh, the whole social fabric. And this was a more subtle approach and it also collided with new ideas in international avant-garde during this period. If we think about constructivism in uh, Russia, if we think about constructivism in Western Europe, for example, the stale or Bauhaus in Weimar. If we think about Dada in Zurich, in Paris, in Berlin, we can see that many of these avant-garde movements actually tried to break with tradition. 
They try to break with their own tradition, pre-war tradition. They try to start a new and start a new life, start a, a new uh, ideology on the basis of rebuilding and uh, actually designing a new world around them. And this required a new language as well, which was instead of uh, expressionism, the, the voice or the, the style of geometric abstraction, which allowed Koshak to, to focus much more on these uh, basic ideas. And it was also in, in the whole outline of the magazine, the whole outline of the ideas behind the magazine, and the whole outline of the approach of Koshak towards presenting these materials. He actually started to create his own artworks. He called these uh, geometric abstract constructions Cape Architectura, Build Architecture in German. It's a uh, picture architecture. So he was actually building these pictures and the idea behind it, he also wrote a manifesto to declare, uh, was to create a new world, to create a new uh, utopistic image for uh, a society which, uh, which could change its ways, change its life so solely uh, through a cultural revolution and not an actual bloody, uh, politically motivated revolution, which was, of course, a failed experience for Koshak and his colleagues. In Vienna, Koshak started to actually um, focus on an international networks and international networking. In our exhibition, we have a infographics which shows the vast international network of Koshak. As you can see, it was not only Koshak who was focused on creating magazines and publications, transmitting the ideas of avant-garde art, but it was a, a very common practice throughout Europe and the world. And during the 1920s, Koshak was in contact with most of the important avant-garde artists and avant-garde editors throughout Europe and the whole world, including the USA and uh, even Japan. To cite a few, you can see the, uh, the uh, magazine of Kurt Schwitters called Merz. You can see the magazine of Theo van Duisburg and uh, Piet Mondrian, The Style, and also the magazine edited or co-edited by uh, Le Corbusier, uh, which was published in Paris. L'Esprit Nouveau, the new uh, spirit. These, these magazines were all tied together during the 1920s. They were publishing each other's contents. They were publishing each other's artists. Koshak was publishing all these uh, magazines uh, as uh, uh, advertisements on the back of uh, of the issues of Ma. And he also, uh, he also uh, translated many of, the, many of the poems, many of the manifestos of these artists uh, in Ma during the 1920s. But Ma was uh, about to close down during the late 20s when Koshak returned to Hungary. He was allowed back in Budapest in 1926 and it was the first time since uh, the early 20s that he was able to uh, come back to Budapest. And he was very keen on returning because as I have said, 
despite this vast international network, he was always very much focused on talking to a Hungarian audience and talking to Hungarian people in general. And when he returned to Budapest, he started a new magazine, which was called Documentum or Document. And he also started to create, <clears throat> actually, uh, posters, advertisement, and graphic design based on the ideas of uh, international avant-garde artists and also and most predominantly the ideas of the Weimar and later Dessau Bauhaus. You can see some of his works here, which uh, of which a few were actually used as posters uh, on the streets of Budapest. And also some of those were used as uh, covers for avant-garde books of poems. This magazine document is very important and very interesting because it actually uh, was focused on documenting contemporary culture in many different aspects. It was not that much focused on uh, uh, avant-garde literature and avant-garde art as Ma was during the Vienna period, but Koshak was focusing on a more, in a more holistic way on the aspects of contemporary culture including architecture, urban planning, and also social issues once again. For example, they were writing about the working conditions of factory workers and the positive or negative uh, aspects of uh, motorization of, of the workforce. For example, they were analyzing the ideas of Fordism and Taylorism which uh, revolutionized uh, factory working or factory working processes in Western Europe and in the US. And they were writing about these ideas and how could they uh, uh, integrate these ideas into the Hungarian situation. But unfortunately, there was only five issues of the magazine document uh, in 1926, 1927, Koshak faced the problems that there was actually no uh, basis, no uh, 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 socialist social background for his ideas in Hungary. Of course, I don't want to go into more details, but during the interwar, interwar period in Hungary, there was a right-wing government throughout the whole period with more or less uh, radical ideas. And uh, of course, the socialist and social democratic workers movement was either uh, disintegrated or it was assimilated by this right-wing government. So there was no real opposition that Koshak uh, would have been able to include in his work or talk to during his work. So he closed down this magazine, which was published as a, a direct integration of his new ideas into the Hungarian social, political, and artistic life. And he started to build up a new movement from the bottom up, which was called the Munka Circle. It means work. Bunka, and it was both the title of a new magazine which he published for one decade from 1928 up until the outbreak of the Second World War, and also the name for this movement, the Work Circle, which was formed around Koshak and around his magazine. Um, the magazine itself was even less focused on art and literature. It was mostly dealing with ideas of politics, of ideas of uh, social issues, and it was especially intended for an audience of young workers. Munko 
was actually a very political magazine during this period. And uh, Koshak was very much involved in uh, the organization and the, and the editorial work of this magazine, but he was also very much involved in uh, the creation of this whole movement around the magazine. For example, we have a very great uh, material of photos taken during the excursions, the trips, the, uh, the events, events that Koshak organized during this period. For example, we can see a group of these young workers, young intellectuals on a Sunday going out to the suburbs, to the forest. And as we can see, they are lying around and they are listening to Koshak, who must have been talking about some political and social ideas during this period. And on the other photo that I would like to show you, we have the wife of Koshak, Shimon Yolan, who was leading the speaking choir of uh, the magazine. They actually came together in their spare time. They prepared uh, poem recitals and even plays for their uh, uh, audience who came from the working class and the, and the workers' movement. And they were trying to spread the ideas of uh, both uh, avant-garde thinking, avant-garde culture, and also an opposing, opposition idea to the uh, prevailing uh, right-wing government, which was dominant in Hungary during this period. And it was actually a very important movement, a very important hub, which lasted for uh, a decade, just as long as Koshak's Ma lasted from the First World War and up until the mid 1920s. But this uh, circle and this magazine was even more important for uh, young intellectuals because it was very inclusive, it was very open, and uh, actually many of the uh, uh, leading artists, leading intellectuals of Hungary, many of whom have uh, exiled, fled the country before, during, or after the Second World War, they were actually coming from the work circle of Koshak during this period. So Munka is a journal, Munka is a, <coughs> as a social movement, as a, as a cohesive force of opposition ideas and new ideas was very important for Koshak and very important for many Hungarian workers and intellectuals during the interwar period. And of course, the Second World War meant a very uh, strong and, and very uh, tragic break in the career, not only of Koshak, but of, uh, of many intellectuals, many artists in Hungary. And after the Second World War, even though there was a very brief uh, period of democratic renewal from 1945 up until 48, later on the socialist uh, takeover took place, and Koshak was also marginalized during this period. So during the 1950s, uh, he was actually not published, he was not included in Hungarian cultural life and, and political life neither, because of his work during the interwar period in Hungary, uh, was viewed as a form of collaboration with the system as he was not fighting against the system, but he was trying to create an alternative society and alternative culture where he was able to talk and organize the, uh, uh, the, the young workers and, and educate them. So the last decades of Koshak's life and Koshak's work was very much defined by a form of uh, 
exclusion from Hungarian uh, artistic life and also at the same time by a very interesting and very fast inclusion of his works or reintegration of his works into uh, Western European artistic life and artistic canon. Koshak started to paint again. And as you can see, he painted once again in a geometric abstract style, but these works were not small anymore. These were la large oil paintings on canvas. And many of these uh, artworks were actually shown and actually sold in, uh, in Paris and other important Western European galleries where he had solo exhibitions during the last years of his life in the 1960s. At the same time in Hungary, his uh, abstract visual art was not accepted. It was uh, solely exhibited. And uh, on the other hand, his literature was very slowly, but it was finally once again accepted by the socialist government. And so by the time of his death in 1967, uh, he was actually once again uh, a, pub a published author. He had many new novels, new uh, books of poems, uh, uh, published in Hungary, and uh, right after his death, his uh, uh, archives, his estate was acquired by the Literary Museum, and within 10 years after his death, his Memorial Museum was opened. So actually, this whole story of Koshak's uh, uh, artistic and literary work is told through the magazines and the uh, groups and, uh, and uh, movements that he edited, that he organized, that he was involved with. Uh, but of course, this is only a small exhibition, a very uh, uh, concentrated uh, permanent exhibition. And we are trying to expand on those subjects which we are touching in this permanent exhibition through our temporary exhibitions. So generally we have uh, temporary exhibitions which are in a way connected to the problems raised in this uh, permanent collection. And I think that this exhibition is actually really good in this way to create a good departure point for talking more and uh, more in depth about the ideas behind the avant-garde, the ideas behind the journal, the ideas behind uh, the socially engaged and, uh, and culturally motiv motivated movement as such that Koshak had created several times throughout his career. We'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And you now I would like to give the space and, and the microphone back to Barbara for discussion. Thank you very much, Merche. Uh, as always, it was absolutely intriguing um, uh, talk. Uh, I like it very much. I also like very much your exhibition or exposition as such, because I think uh, for me as a curator, it's always quite difficult to you know, somehow present uh, visually uh, works which were um, uh, used for different purposes, right? Uh, journals, you usually read them at home, uh, for example, it's something you have or on your uh, lap. Uh, so it's just for you and you are reading the literature piece. But on the other hand, in the exposition, it's something final, right? Uh, you frame it, you have it on a wall. So my first question before I go to uh, Lajos Kashak, which uh, is such an amazing person in the end, is how you worked with the exposition. Uh, was that difficult to put it together all and uh, somehow not just present the idea of uh, first half of 20th century, which is really uh, very much about avant-garde and uh, finding new ways to the new world, new societies and so on. Uh, and put it together with li uh, uh, life of uh, one personality who uh, was leading somehow this party. Edith and, and Judith 
who were the curators of this exhibition in 2011. They were very uh, lucky in several ways because the museum has just been renewed. So the space was, was in a good shape and it was completely empty. So they had the, the, the time and they had the, the space to create something from the ground. And they took the time to, to look through the whole collection, to, to read the materials and to try to, <clears throat> to make sense of this material in a way and rearrange it so that uh, it does not talk only about one person and the, they don't uh, create uh, a statue or a memorial to this person, but they try to engage in those aspects which uh, are open for interpretation, open for discussion. And I think that this exhibition is really good in uh, creating this discursive space where you can, you can talk about different aspects. You can focus either on Koshak himself, you can focus on the magazines, you can focus on the content, you can focus on visual arts, and still you have all these pieces of the puzzle together to, to create a coherent narrative. So I think that it is actually really hard to depart from from uh, uh, a monographic point of view because the, the material itself is very much focused on Kashak as we have the, the archives of this person. Uh, and on the other hand, it's also very fruitful to, to try to, to have uh, a more broader view or a more, more broader context. And I think that this is... Uh, an aspect that we should actually try to, to focus on and to, to educate even, to, uh, to try to, to look at the materials, to look at the, the content of a project or an exhibition in a more broader uh, context and try to uh, reassess the basic questions that lie behind the, the materials and not just tell the story, but also ask those questions and, uh, and make the visitors also ask those questions which are relevant and, and important even today. Yes. And not just uh, a piece of historical material which, is, uh, which has no actual relevance besides its value or, or historical data. Yeah, I think this is perfect because if you like, it's, it doesn't apply just for exposition, but if you'd like to not just incorporate others <laughs> or be open to public, uh, you uh, you can't give all the answers. You have to um, yeah, make a you know, blind spot for someone to look for themselves, I guess. Uh, it leads me to another question because, uh, and I think you've mentioned it many times, the connection between literature and visual culture, I guess, visual arts. And um, the uh, second part of the second question is, uh, I'm very interested in uh, graphics. Uh, and I think this is really golden age for graphics again in 20th century mm -hmm. because of the journals also. Uh, you've presented Benesh, uh, which I really would like to thank you <laughs> because it, it's lovely work. So it's very nice uh, you've chosen this one. Uh, so yeah, could you uh, expand somehow on the um, relationship between li literature and visual culture? It, it was very important for Koshak from the first moment on, and I think it was very common in uh, expressionism and, uh, uh, and even futurism. So turn of the century, uh, modernism and early avant-garde, and these early avant-garde publications, they were very much focused on, on the integration of visual arts into these book format or magazine format. Uh, publications they also very they, they experimented with the technique they experimented with style they experimented with different formats so it was a very interesting period for uh, for these ideas of of uh, uh, putting visual and textual parts together 
for example, Bortnik, Shandor Bortnik, he was very, very much interested in creating these kinds of constellations. For example, he, he made il illustrations to the poems of Erzi Uivari and shown her, uh, she was the uh, younger sister of Koshak and uh, she was supposed to publish a book of poems in 1918. So her very early, very uh, suggestive, very expressionistic poems. And Bortnik actually created these illustrations which were not directly related to the, to the uh, poems, but they were focused on, more on to uh, creating the same atmosphere, this very fearful, very uh, uh, depressed uh, atmosphere, which was, of course, predominantly created by the, the context of the First World War. But unfortunately, this book of poems was not published, but we are working on an exhibition which is going to uh, show the, the, the life and the art of Erzsi Uivari and Chandor Barta. And now we are gathering the, the drawings, the actual uh, uh, drawings by Bortnik, which survived, fortunately, in different museums and private collections. And so we will be able to, in a way, reconstruct this uh, intended book of poems, which were uh, originally intended to, to focus on this this uh, uh, total work of art or this interference between the visual and the textual parts. But this is just one example and there are much more and many in, uh, in the whole story <clears throat> of Koshak's journals. So he was always very keen on to incorporate the visual elements even before he himself started to, to experiment with visual arts. Thank you very much. Um, when we are uh, talking about a visual uh, in this current situation, we uh, quite often use it for universal somehow. It seems that we are communicating via pictures or images much easier than via words. Uh, I don't think it's true, but on the other hand, the um, idea of universal language uh, is something, again, at least for me, connected with avant-garde and with, with this kind of journals. Uh, not just because they're really circulated uh, through the, not just Central Europe, right, the Europe as such. But uh, um, you know Hubert van der Berg quite well, and we are thinking about uh, uh, and sm small exhibition actually, but also focused on universal language. So this is again a one invitation for you to Olomouc because it would be very nice to have you on board in this. And we are thinking about diagonal and uh, its role in the whole system of visual language or um, visual system of journeys. Mm -hmm. So could you think uh, for yourself, um, uh, is, it, is it possible to think about this kind of communication as universal in some sense, or um, is it just a metaphor for you? Um, it's, it's, it's a really hard topic and it was addressed several times by all these Hungarian and uh, international avant-garde artists. They, uh, there were times that uh, they were experimenting or, or interested in creating this, this common language on different levels. For example, the Esperanto movement was also tied with, with several strings to, to the avant-garde. Also this very uh, basic uh, geometric abstract visual language was developed in a way to, to make this uh, common ground or, or this, uh, this common platform between different uh, languages and different journals. But on this same, at the same time, or on the other hand, Koshak was very much focused on the Hungarian language. And he was always talking to a Hungarian audience. He was always translating uh, these poems, these manifestos from different languages into Hungarian. And it was because his main goal was to, to reach those people in Hungary, those uh, workers, young intellectuals who were not able to access those materials without this uh, filter, without this help. And I think that this 
was actually a very uh, conscious and very motivated decision on behalf of Koshak. But he was also interested in creating this step towards the international community, towards creating <clears throat> special issues which were intended for a German or an international audience. He was uh, getting his own poems translated into, into more broadly spoken um, languages, uh, German and French. But of course, it's all on the uh, verbal or the, or the textual level. So uh, I think that this, this aspect of creating a universal visual language was addressed on several levels, but it was never fully developed, at least not on behalf of Koshak. So, uh, but other artists, uh, for example, uh, Moholinoid, Laszlo Moholinoid, and uh, Jörg Kepes, they were all um, in touch with Koshak or involved with Koshak's several stages of their life. And they were much more interested in, in this universal aspect of the arts and visuality. And they developed it much further. Thank you again. Uh, yeah, I think you've mentioned a few times uh, word education and educational purposes and so on. And I think our work is uh, in many levels educational uh, or the aim is to educate somehow. Uh, so can you expand on this a little bit also? What does it mean uh, to educate? Because I feel you have a, quite a sympathy for Kashak, don't you? In uh, some uh, level, at least, I think you must have, to, you are interested in his work. Um, but I think we share also some sort of, uh, mm, it's not a fear, but um, I think it's much more about uh, to be critical or something like that. Uh, because in, in, in many levels, it seems quite um, uh, utopian, I guess. It seems like a utopy uh, to build a new society, which is going to be better. So uh, was Kashag himself, uh, uh, how did he feel? Was he really so utopistic or were he, because he wasn't naive, definitely he wasn't naive. So what do you think about him in this moment? Um, it, it changed several times during his career or during his life. But uh, I think it's an important factor that he was not uh, university educated. He was an autodidactic uh, intellectual and artist. And he was always very keen on learning new skills, new uh, ideas. He was very receptive. He was very open. And it was partly due to this uh, state of... Uh, of, of being a, a, a decent person or, a, or a, um, uh, someone who is without a, a very distinct class or very distinct education. And I think that he was also creating these uh, sometimes realistic, sometimes uh, utopistic, sometimes dystopic, uh, um, but always educational and always in a way not didactic, but uh, critical ideas to people who were in a way similar to him or, or in a way uh, uh, in, a, in a situation which was close to his own situation, which was very, it was, it, it was not uncommon, at least in Hungary during this period. So um, I think that... Uh, he was, of course, not uh, naive. And uh, when we say a utopistic uh, um, idea, uh, in the case of Koshak, it's, it's never, you know, fully developed. It's never, uh, he was never fully committed to this. It was one approach that he tried, which he incorporated, and it very much... Uh, collided, for example, with what the Russian constructivists thought about the role of art in society during the early 20s. But of course, it was an idea which was replaced by a more rationalistic, a more technology-oriented, a more uh, uh, architecture-oriented version of this utopia, 
which was coming from the Bauhaus in the mid 1920s. And I think that Kaszak was very open towards these ideas. He was not uh, copying these ideas. He was actually translating and transmit transmitting his ideas uh, to, to Hungarian groups and artists, and uh, which he was, uh, what his main ideas or core ideas were, and which he was always very committed to, was actually um, to make art uh, that is relevant uh, in, uh, in always, this, always that context which is, is created. So he always changed his style. He always changed the, the topics that he was talking about. He even changed uh, the, uh, the techniques that he used. First, he wrote poems. He wrote these agitational uh, expressionistic poems. Later, during the 1920s and 30s, he wrote novels, uh, which were... Uh, very realistic, they were not avant-garde in their style, and they were intended to, you know, in a way document, describe, and also uh, uh, in a way uh, uh, make um, suggestions to these young workers, to these young people, how could they change the, the situation that they are currently in or where they, their relatives or uh, or colleagues are in their lives. Okay, uh, I think um, I have a last question for you, but also it might be some sort of a starting point for the next uh, lecture. Uh, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, you talked about vagabondism and how Kashak traveled through the city and walked through the city. And this kind of flannerism, um, uh, when you talk about his realistic experiences and her realistic aims in the end and realism in his artistic choices, I guess, this is something which somehow works for me uh, because if I imagine him walking through the city and seeing the uh, whole architecture and the system and people in the city and so on and so on. And then um, there is, well, it's a vast connection, <laughs> but on the other hand, you were talking about infographics and maps and this kind of things. It somehow clicks, right? Uh, it's, um, it's, again, it leads me to universe somehow. You're in the center the, in the universe, not center, center, but you are moving from this and making connections and rebuilding the world somehow. So yes, I agree with you. There is no utopia. It's somehow responsibility or something like that towards the world. So yeah, now I would lead you to the conclusion, I guess, and give you a floor to, uh, to final remarks on this uh, topic. This is a very interesting topic, actually, and I think that in the in the lecture that is going to focus on our temporary exhibition series about workers' culture in interwar Hungary and avant-garde magazines on on an international scale, uh, with a focus on on their on their social ideas and and uh, and programs. So in this lecture, we are going to talk more about these ideas and more about how style and content and purpose are matched or mixed together in Koshak's life and Koshak's works. And I think that it's, it's actually a really interesting uh, mixture and a really interesting story which could be told from very different angles. And I think that this permanent collection also, also shows. You no, know, I just saw that I was talking for much more than 40 minutes and I'm sorry for that. But still, you know, it's, uh, it's possible to talk much, even much more about these topics because, uh, because it's a very interesting and very rich uh, material. So I would once again like to encourage all the viewers and all those who are still interested in Kashak to, to visit either the website of the museum in a few weeks when we're going to have this online virtual version of the exhibition available online or come to Budapest in the coming uh, months or during the ne next year and visit this, this uh, permanent collection 
in person because uh, now we know that we are not going to close down this exhibition and not going to change it during the next year, but we will still leave it as it is. And we are going to create temporary exhibition that complement and expand these topics even more for the, the coming months. So thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, uh, I'm looking very much forward to seeing you once again for the next uh, topic of this series, which is going to be uh, museum education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to stress it because I love this. I really love your exposition and I really admire your work. I think it's really specific and I would Thank love you very much. to bring you, I would love to bring you to Olomouc at least next year and we'll see how it works then. Uh, it might be interesting uh, for the public. We are going to organize a real discussion in Olomouc uh, uh, during uh, November. So please stay in touch, uh, uh, look at us, <laughs> follow us <laughs> on uh, all the platforms. I would also like to stress that we are still uh, dealing with quiz and you can win tickets to Kashag Museum to Budapest whenever you'd like to travel there and books and much more. So stay with us, stay interested in Kashag's life and in Mersche and Edith and others works there. So thank you, have a lovely evening. Thank you, Mersche. Uh, all the best to Budapest and we'll see each other quite soon. Goodbye, have a Bye. nice evening. Bye-bye.